Today we're going to be talking about blue zones. Has anyone heard of the term blue zones before? No. Good. <laughs> so what are blue zones? Blue zones are pockets of populations around the world where the citizens live to be a hundred years or older. So there's five of them that have been documented, and we're going to take a trip today around the globe and explore some of the diets that these people follow and how we can incorporate that into our own diets as well. So some of you have probably heard of Okinawa, Japan. That's a small island south of Japan. Uh, that's one of the more famous ones. Or Sardinia, Italy. So how did they get the name Blue Zones? Does anyone know where that term comes from? That's, that's a good guess. Any other guesses? Blue Zones. Why the name Blue Zones? It's based off of demographic maps. So when you look at maps of disease risk, this one's of the United States, the darker the color, the higher the incidence of heart disease. So you see it's concentrated here in the south. Right? You guys see this blue area right here? You know you know what, what town that is? What city that is right there? Colorado. Denver. Denver's got the, the lowest BMI of any, any city in the entire country. So that's how they got the, word, the term blue zones. And so when you map this out across the world, you get these pockets of areas. So let, let's talk a little bit about the itineraries today. We're going to take a field trip around the world. You guys are going to decide where we go in the order in which we travel. I'd like to go to Disneyland. <laughs> well, then we're going to come back to the U.S. and go somewhere very close to Disneyland and check out that dietary pattern as well. Then we're going to look at the current U.S. dietary patterns and the recommendations that we have here today by the U.S. government. And then we're going to apply some of that knowledge that we've learned today to our holiday season and then also long term as well. So really quickly, the objectives, there's three of them. Uh, at the end of this presentation, hopefully, we can all name three commonalities, three similarities between the blue zones. What brings them all together? Why do they have such low risk of heart disease? Identifying three areas of the U.S. diet that will increase our risk for heart disease. And describe five ways that maybe you individually can improve your diet long term to reduce your risk for heart disease. So before, uh, let me do two things first. Uh, this is my website, seantherd.com. If you got a handout, it'll be on this handout under recommended resources in the middle. Uh, so you can check out some other videos and other recommended stuff. There's a bunch of things you can look at. Also on the recommended resources, there's the Blue Zone page. So this isn't just my presentation. This is a book, thank you Karen, this is a book that you can actually get from the library. Apparently you can get it for free. From the Ford Foundation. From the Ford Foundation. So this, this is, uh, we're going to be condensing this 300 page <coughs> book into a 30 minute long presentation. And this is their website and there's also recipes. So a lot of those recommended resources are recipe pages. Okay, so we have five areas we're going to be talking about today. The, we have Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, Italy, Icaria, Greece, Loma Linda, California, and Nicoya, Costa Rica. So where do we want to go first? Italy. Okay, we'll go to Italy. <laughs> you ready? You ready for takeoff? Yeah. There we go. So we're going to scroll. There. Okay, these are nine recurring concepts that we're going to see in all five areas that we go to. 
so the researchers in this book identified nine areas that help lower their risk for heart disease. The first one is knowing your purpose. So having a sense of purpose and value in your life, whether it's your children, whether it's community service, having something that's beyond yourself that gives you value. They all have low stress levels. You know that type A personalities, right? Stress, high stress levels, so they all live a low stress life. The 80% rule, which is what you'll see on my tips on the top of that handout, the 80% rule is you eat until you're 80% full, not till you're stuffed, not till you're 100% full, not till you have to unbutton your pants. 80, the 80% rule. Social networking, so they're often involved in their community, whether it's volunteers, whether it's at a church. So they all have some sort of social ties, such as this group here. They drink wine. They all drink lots of wine. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. They all have a sense of belonging. So what research finds is that it's not just necessarily religious, but people that aren't religious, but that go to mass or they go to other religious ceremonies, have higher longevity for some reason. It's that, that sense of belonging. Family first. So many of these people will marry for life. They move naturally, and we'll talk about that later, but they're all in, actively engaged in their daily life. It involves movement without the gym. And they all have a, a whole food plant-centered diet. So it's the centerpiece of their diet is plant foods, and then they complement it with meat and dairy. And we'll look at those patterns now. So first we're gonna, who's got that phone? <laughs> All right, so here we are. We're in Sardinia, Italy, okay? Let me paint a picture for you. It's an island, it's a very mountainous, very rugged island. And so when the people there, there's activity that they do every single day and it involves them going up and down and up and down. And so part of their life, just going to the store, going to a friend's house, involves a lot of rigorous activity. Their diet is actually, it's pretty simple. It's one of the most simplest diets of all five places we'll see today. It focuses on whole grains. Some of their dairy products that they have, oftentimes their, their food scraps will go towards the animals that they get their dairy from. So whether it's sheep or whether it's goats. So even the animals that they're raising eat the same diet they do. And, and not to complicate things too much, but it changes the nutrient profile of that dairy to make it healthier. Meat is reserved for Sundays. So they're not eating meat every single day, but maybe it's just a few times a week or it's used to complement a meal. Many of these folks walk somewhere, they average about six to 10 miles a day. There's no, there's no not as many cars, there's no streets, no buses. They walk a lot. They spend a lot of time walking, whether it's to the market, whether it's grocery stores. And because of the terrain, they say that that 30 minutes, 30 minutes is like on a stair stepper for them. They enjoy wine. 64% of their diet's made from plant foods and then they, they complement it with meat. And they have 10 times more centenarians than in the U.S. So when you look at the concentration of people that live to be 100, they're highly concentrated here. And they have a higher quality of life in the old age. And so that's one of the recurring themes here is it's not just about how long they live, it's the quality of their life. So where are we going to next? Oh wait, I forgot something. I have photos for you. Here's some pictures of their diet. So here they have this type of cheese that they make from that milk I was talking about. This is the wine. They grow these grapes. And because of the sun exposure in Sardinia, the grapes have a higher antioxidant content, four times that of the red wine here in the US. So it's that red wine, the high antioxidant content that they think contributes to their lifespan. 
they have this flatbread, this interesting flatbread, and they have dishes that are grain-based and complemented with seafood. It depends, though, where they are. If they're closer to the coast, they eat more seafood. If they're farther inland, they actually find that the longest living people in Sardinia are the ones that live inland because there's more mountainous terrain. So they're hiking all day long. Okay, so we've been to Italy. Where are we gonna go next? We can go to California, we can go to Costa Rica, we can go to Greece, or we can go to Japan. Greece. Greece, okay. You know, there's, there's similarities between Greece and, Sar and Sardinia, where, where we just went to. They're both isolated islands in the Mediterranean, but we'll find that they actually follow very different meal patterns. And that's very interesting because one of the frequent questions I get here at the hospital is what's a Mediterranean diet? And what, what you'll find though is that there's over 20 countries that border the Mediterranean and they all follow slightly different dietary patterns. Some are high in wine, some are low in wine, some consume more olive oil, some don't. But you'll notice between these two countries they have similar longevity and similar low risks of heart disease. This is the island where people forget to die. That's what they, 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 they Yeah, they forget. It's going to be overrun like Japan for you. <laughs> so this is what most people would consider a Mediterranean diet. It's uh, high in vegetables, greens, fruits beans and then complemented with meat, fish, and olive oil. So it's what most people would consider a Mediterranean diet. What we find is that the fruits and vegetables constitute at least 60% of the diet. So they use that as the centerpiece. Um, just like we'll see in Japan, there's a lot of herbs, teas that are consumed. So there's a high antioxidant content in things like rosemary and sage, oregano, these are very high in antioxidants, more so than almost any other food out there. So what we find is the frequent consumption of herbs, especially they're growing a lot of these foods too. And so that gardening, that gardening provides not only food for them, but it's also a source of exercise, <coughs> activity. And because it's, they don't have to think about it, it's more entertaining for them. They have oils, instead of butter. So they focus on things like olive oil, and most of the time it's consumed at room temperature. It's not high heated. They're not frying their food. It's consumed cold with their bread or as an additive to the top of their meal. They average about three and a half tablespoons per day. So they're not, it's not an overconsumption. Three and a half tablespoons is a little high, but they make it work. One of my favorite things about Greece is they like to nap. Who here likes to take naps? <laughs> so what we find, if you're an occasional napper, I don't know what the definition is of an occasional napper. Occasional nappers have a 12% reduced risk of heart disease. And if you're a daily napper, like these people, you have a 35% risk of dying from a heart attack. They have family and friends as a priority. And one of the interesting things is they don't wear a watch. They don't have the sense of urgency that we do. And so that lowers their stress level as well. They have rugged terrain so just like anywhere. we saw in Sardinia. So that exercise is part of their natural life. It's not something that they have to think about. One in three lives till at least 90 years old. One in three people. You go there, one in three people is nine years old. Very low rates of dementia. They have lower rates of cancer and 50% less rate of heart disease. So what we find here, and this is similar to the research today, is that a diet that's good for your heart is also good for your brain. It's good for other organs as well, your kidneys. And so there's not one diet for different diseases. A heart healthy diet's good for a bunch of different chronic ailments.
They have half the rate of cardiovascular disease, a third of the rate of depression, very low dementia. The people are sharp, very sharp. They eat six times the amount of beans as Americans, and we'll see that later. They drink six cups of coffee a day, fish twice a week, and meat five times a month. They consume a quarter of the amount of sugar as we do, and they drink, you guys ready for this? Two to four glasses of wine a day. How many meals a day do they eat? All of these populations consume what we would consider three meals. What we find is that it's the size of these meals that differ. They often eat larger meals in the beginning of the day. The largest meal will be lunch, and the smallest meal will often be either breakfast or dinner. And the dinners consume kind of early. They're not eating a big meal and then going to bed or laying down. So they might eat at six or seven, and then that, that's it. You'll see these bean dishes. Here they have uh, a type of salad that they make, a Greek salad. A lot of beans, they have some olive oil, some fruit. That's what you would traditionally think of as a Mediterranean diet. If you open up most Mediterranean diet cookbooks, you'll see foods similar to this. Okay, so we've been to Italy, we've been to Greece. We need to either go to Japan, California, or Costa Rica. Japan. Costa Rica. Japan? I love how everyone's on the same page with this. You know, how hard it would be to plan a vacation with 50 people. We said Japan, right? Here we go. Here we go, and away. There it is. Can you guys see that? Look at that There's Godzilla, right? <laughs> <laughs> You'll notice that a lot of these places are isolated. They're not all islands, though. Two of them are not islands, but they are isolated. And so that doesn't just help with some of the genes, right? Because there's not a huge... Some places are more genetically diverse than others, and so um, that can work out in their favor. Uh, but what we find is that uh, because they don't have such an influence from the outside world, their diets have, have carried through for a, a good, the good first half of the 20th century. It's the latter half of the 20th century that became quite a problem. They call them the land of the immortals. This is, I believe this is one of the second most famous uh, blue zones, isolated. Uh, the majority of the calories come from sweet potatoes, so they actually have 67 percent of their diet is sweet potatoes. And the reason for this is, you say, well, why aren't they having rice? Well, on the island, the weather is very bad, and so what they find is that rice is very difficult to grow in Okinawa, but the sweet potatoes are much hardier, so it uh, provides a good source of calories as well as vitamin A, and beta carotene, all these different. Uh, vitamins and minerals, so it's very, very rich for them. They have a diet that's high in tea, which is high in antioxidants. They have mugwort. Apparently, that's something they consumed in Harry Potter. Mugwort. Um, Turmeric and ginger. They also have soy. It's consumed in its fermented form. You guys probably know it as to tofu. Uh, <coughs> the reason that they think tofu is so beneficial is because not only does it have flavonoids, but it also has something called phytoestrogen. So most people consume, well most people think that when you consume soy, you're exposing yourself to estrogen, so they avoid it. But what we find is that soy actually contains phytoestrogen, it's a plant-based estrogen. So it doesn't activate our estrogen receptors the same way that uh, an estrogen supplement would. So it actually binds to the estrogen receptors, so it lowers our estrogen exposure. So what we find is that people that consume soy have lower risks of breast cancer, and those that have had breast cancer have lower risk of getting breast cancer again if they consume soy. They're vegetarian by circumstance. Being on the island, uh, it, it led, it sort of, their geography helped build their diet, not the other way around. 
They get a lot of sunshine, so vitamin D, that's really common, especially a lot of these folks are working outside, right? They don't have desk jobs. They stay active. So one of the things I found fascinating about this population is uh, they, their furniture is on the floor. They don't have chairs. And so what that means is all day long they're getting up and down, up and down, 30 times plus a day. They're getting up off the floor and back down on the floor. So lower risk of falls, better bone density. They like to garden and fish. So just like we've seen with the other two places I've checked out, this is built into their diet, they're not uh, their lifestyle. They're not thinking about exercise. It's part of, part of their lifestyle. 94% whole plant foods. 76% vegetables. So this is sort of what you would imagine someone to live 105, 110 would consume. This is probably, this is more vegetarian than any of the other diets we'll see today. They're eight times less likely to die from heart disease than compared to the US. They also have lower rates of prostate, breast, and colon cancer. So like I mentioned before, this diet isn't just good for your heart, it's good for everything. 66% live independently until about 97 years of age. So it's the quality of their life, not just the quantity that we're focusing on here. They maintain a healthy weight throughout life. They don't have these huge weight fluctuations as they age. Their weight stays pretty stable. And just like we saw in Sardinia, a lot of these um, a lot of the meat that they do consume, if any, the animals are fed the same food that they eat. They feed the food scraps that they eat, so the animals are eating that same high potency diet that they are. This is where that 80% rule comes in, eating until they're 80% full. That's, that's their concept. One of the interesting quotes I found in this book, in this chapter, but it says heart disease is a process, not an event. So prevention has to be the same way, right? It's the choices we make every single day. It's not about what we do one day or two days out of the year, but it's about the small changes that we can follow through on a daily basis. There's your sweet potatoes on the bottom right. We see their food pyramid. Vegetables and fruits are at the bottom, beans, uh, low glycemic index grains. So what you'll notice is that these populations, one of the biggest things you'll notice is that they're not consuming processed foods. There's no candy, there's no cookies, there's no chips, there's no crackers, maybe a little bit of tortillas that they made, something like that, but it's very, uh, it's very <coughs> unprocessed food. A lot of dishes with soups, noodles, <coughs> and then they add meat to it. How are you guys doing so far? Still awake. Still awake? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's the best compliment a presenter can get. Okay, so we've been to Japan, we've been to Italy, we've been to Greece. So we have two locations left. We have Costa Rica and we have California. Costa Rica. <laughs> okay, that was like a 50 50 split. Okay, how about this? Raise your hand if you want to go to Costa Rica. I guess like 25%. Okay, raise your hand if you want to go to California. Oh, come on. Okay, we'll go to, we'll, we'll go to, we'll go to Costa Rica first, and then the nice thing about Don Melinda is it'll bring us back home. <laughs> okay, here we go. We're going to go all the way across the world. Can you see that? Yep. This is the first island. Well, this is not an island. This is the first place we've been to today that's not an island. Hello? Is it a peninsula? Yeah, it's a peninsula. Of mountainous peninsula. And There we go. This is one of the most fascinating for me uh, because their, their diet is actually, uh, it's, it's such a drastic uh, difference compared to Okinawa. Uh, they consume what we call the three sisters. Have you heard of that term before? Not the mountains, but the food. 
corn and beans and squash, that makes the, the majority of the food that they consume. And so there's an agricultural benefit to, to growing all three at the same time, but uh, nutritionally, they're, they're, it's a pretty complete meal right there. They eat a light dinner, they get up with the sun, and they go to bed with the sun. Unlike Greece, with Greece they sleep in. They sleep in, they stay up late. They chat with friends here, they, 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 there's a lot of work that has to be done, so they, they follow the, the patterns of the sun. They get a lot of vitamin D from the sun. Over half their diet is whole plant foods, which is similar to what we see. They do consume a fair bit of dairy. But remember, these a lot of the dairy that we've been seeing today is uh, from free-ranged animals, and so it changes the nutrient profile of it. They have colorful fruits, often which they grow themselves, and they eat fewer calories. So very interesting, all five of the populations that we'll see today consume an average of 1,800 to 1,900 calories a day. So this isn't a low-calorie diet. It's not a high-calorie diet. It's an adequate calorie diet. And like, we'll, like we saw with Okinawa, it's not just the calories, it's the nutrient density. And so even though these people consume three to four times the bulk of the food we do in the U.S., it's the, the same calories for the, the size is much bigger. And so they get full quicker with fewer calories. So it's not a, this isn't a starvation diet. They're, they're consuming adequate calories, but they're full. They're very full because the vegetables and the fruits and the whole grains, the beans and the water content from these foods, they get filled up on the water content and the fiber. These people love to eat sugar. They love sugar. They have sugar in their coffee. So just some quick facts from the book. They eat meat about one to two times a week. 60-year-olds have twice the chance to get to 90 compared to the U.S. So if you're 60 years old here in Nicoya, Costa Rica, you're twice as likely to reach 90. And at birth, you're four times more likely to reach 90. 23% lower risk of cancer compared to other areas in Costa Rica. One of the most puzzling facts in this book is that the people in Costa Rica have multiple <coughs> partners. They're in, in Nicoya, they have multiple partners. So unlike other countries where they marry for life, here they kind of do the opposite. They sleep seven to nine hours a night. They usually go to bed at the same time and wake up at the same time. One of the things that the people that they interview in this book, they say they have a strong sense of purpose. Oftentimes their work is related to providing for their family. So they have that sense of purpose. Uh, interestingly, their water, they have very hard water. They estimate that they get about a gram of calcium per day per six liters of water consumed. So a gallon and a half of water will consume a, a They'll consume a gram of calcium, which is about as much as we need, about 1,200 milligrams per day. So just from the water alone. There are three sisters, the corn, the bean, the squash, helps lower their LDL. That's the bad cholesterol. You guys all had your cholesterol checked. Your LDL is the bad cholesterol. So the corns, beans, and squash help lower their LDL and raise their HDL, their, their good cholesterol. Who here has a, for the men in this room, who here has a daughter? Daughters? Men with daughters? Apparently there is a, men with daughters. So what they find is that for every daughter that a man has, their life expectancy increases by about 75 weeks. <laughs> yeah, well that's, that's over a year, a year and a half. I've got twin daughters. Does that mean I get 150 weeks? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they look, they look the same. There you go. Um, one of the interesting things that they mentioned, they interviewed this one centurion in Costa Rica. And what they said is that if they wanted sugar or salt, they had to walk 18 miles to the store. Oh my God. Okay? Now, that's not true, you know, for all the populations, but it gives you a good idea, you know, if they wanted to get something that was not 
the healthiest, they had to work for it. So real quick, you'll see the corn beans, the squash, you'll see some fruits, very, very um, stress-free living. A lot of the times they grow their own vegetables, grow their own fruits. Okay, we're gonna go to Loma Linda, California, and then we're gonna take a quick break. Does that sound good? Yeah, sure. Is that okay? You guys doing okay? Yep. Yeah. I know this is a lot of information. Uh, here we go. Any Cal like Californians here? Like people that lived in California, Southern California? Born and raised. Oh, there you go. Here we go. You guys ready to take off? Yeah. All right. Make sure your seat's back and the tray table's upright. Of all the places, right? Okay, Loma Linda, California. What makes this population so special? California would think it'd be a stressful place, right? So there's a large concentration of Seventh-day Adventists. And so Seventh-day Adventists tend to be vegetarian. My sister dated a Seventh-day Adventist once and my mom accidentally served him some chicken broth. He was more strict. But a lot of the Seventh-day Adventists are actually not vegan. Has anyone tried the pie on the black plate? Anybody have pie on the black plate? I saw one person had pumpkin pie you on did. the black no. plate. Yeah, you did. Is that, is that you, Dr. Chapel? I just picked it up. Oh, okay, here. I was going to get the clear plate. No, I'm going to let you try it before I ruin the surprise. Oh, great. I thought it was good. No, 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 it's a good surprise. Okay. So, um,. Here we go. Most of their diet, they're vegetarian. So some of them have some eggs and some milk, yep. but they consume a lot of vegetables. They consume fruit, beans. Beans are tied with longevity. They're tied with lower risk of colon cancer. They're tied with lower rates of heart disease. And the reason for that is beans bind to cholesterol in our digestive tract when we eat them. And so that cholesterol, instead of getting reabsorbed in our GI tract, we just eliminate it. So anything that's high in fiber, these diets are very high in fiber, 50, 70 grams of fiber a day. So that, that fiber is binding to cholesterol. They're getting rid of it instead of reabsorbing it. They have low, low intake of sugar, salt, refined grains, and they don't consume alcohol or caffeine. So it's very interesting, you know, is, is that alcohol and the caffeine, is that helping them? Because we see these other populations consume quite a bit of it. And that's sort of the take home message with this presentation, is that diets are not black and white. They're not. There's not a strict standard that we can see that will increase your life expectancy or heart disease rates. It's, there's a variety, there's a huge scale in your, in your diet. But you'll notice that they're plant-based. They eat very few eat meat, but some do, in the form of fish. And they have nuts and seeds. So let's take a look at my, my cool facts here from the book. Oh, I didn't, I didn't do this one. But what they found is that a quarter cup of nuts, like mixed nuts, not roasted or salted, but a quarter cup a day uh, is in, increases their life expectancy. They consume nuts at least five times weekly, so almost every day. So they're, they're, this is just some random pictures. So, you know, they're, it's vegetarian diet, right? There's nothing, it's nothing particular about it. So here they have some tacos. Here, this is, um, there's a, on the recommended resources, there's a page. It's called the Engine Number no. 2 Cookbook. This is the lasagna from it. I've made that lasagna before. It's very good. How was that pie, by the way? It's like lasagna. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was very good. The, the, the pie on the black plate is, is vegan. 
There's no eggs, there's no milk, there's no there's no dairy in it. So I, I urge you to try it because what am I gonna do with forty five pieces of pie? No. <laughs> It was very tasty. I like it better than the regular. There we go, there we go. Like the spices. Okay, so we've learned... We'll go over it later. Okay, so standard American... Oh, I don't know. Today's a stretch break. Do you guys want to get up for a couple minutes? Stand up. Up, up, up. I think Karen, in the purple back there, will lead us in a, in a short, brief stretch session. <laughs> so, I'm Let's take a look at what we're doing here in the U.S. We'll look at some suggestions, and then I have some meal ideas, some ways we can eat around the holidays so we can live to be 100. So what we find when we look at the U.S. diet is it's quite, quite drastically different from the five places that we've seen today. And the biggest one is actually the processed food processed food part of the pie. Yeah. It's the, the white rice, it's the white flour, the added oils, the processed oils, the crackers, the cookies, the chips, the desserts. You're not seeing that in these five groups. Our, our, our dairy consumption is not too far off, but we're having more meat than they are. But I, I think after reading this book, a big red flag for me is just the processed foods. One of the authors noted when they were going through the kitchens, right? They go through these people's kitchens and take a look at what they're eating. What they're finding is that there's not a snack cupboard. If they want a meal, they have to cook it, you know? So there's not, there's not a lot of quick, let me grab and go kind of thing. And unfortunately, our fruit, vegetables, I lumped them all together because they're such a small piece of the pie. Fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds, and beans are 12% of our diet. And so if we could somehow reverse these two, we, we would live not just longer, guys. It's the quality of our lives. You want to be, these people are 80, 90 years old, and they're out there chopping wood and walking to their friends' houses and going to the market and grocery shop. These people are active, they're gardening. And they, they look younger too. <laughs> now, um, on the recommended, everything's on here, everything's on here. On, on the recommended resources, there's the um, diet, the, Diet, healthy dietary guidelines for healthy Americans 2015 to 2020. So the U.S. government puts out every five years guidelines for what we should eat. And what we'll find is that the current U.S. guidelines are actually pretty on par with how a lot of these centarians are living. So let's take a look. Okay, um, these slides won't take very long. So starchy vegetables and beans. So what we're looking at here is the blue bars are the ranges, the ranges of recommended intakes. And the orange dots, is, is that's where we're at. So let's take a look. Let's take a look. We can do anywhere from the 30 to, to 70. That sort of makes up. You know, we don't have any teenagers. Anybody a teenager? Teenager? <laughs> Okay, so what we see, starchy vegetable intake, guys. That's the sweet potatoes, okay? The corn, we're, we're not having enough of that. That's the take home message. I'm not gonna go over the exact numbers. There's an awesome PDF on their website and you can read all the numbers all day long if you want. Uh, so we know that for males and for females, uh, we're not having enough of these starchy vegetables. These are high in fiber, high in antioxidants. And then for the beans, we know that beans are some of the most healthy foods. What we find across all five populations is that they're consuming beans, and they're consuming it daily. So the current recommendation is, a, is about one cup a day. And there's some awesome, awesome research out there right now that's showing that three, three cans of beans a week. So you can make them yourself at home, but the equivalent of three cans of beans 45 ounces a week. People with diabetes have lower blood sugars. They lose weight even though they're actually adding in 
the beans to their diet. Fruits and vegetable intake. Well, this was a no-brainer, right? We're simply not taking in enough fruits and vegetables. I met with an open-heart patient once, and I was telling her, you know, I was suggesting for breakfast, maybe an orange and a banana. And she said, well, I, I can't have okay. two pieces of fruit at one meal. So she tried to bargain with me and say, well, is it okay if I have half of an orange? And, and so this is one of the areas that um, you'll actually notice that the, the can't hold up my left hand. Uh, the fruit intake is generally pretty low, except for Costa Rica and a little bit with Loma Linda. The fruit consumption is pretty low in these places because they're islands, they're isolated, and a lot of them don't have tropical weather that facilitates fruit growth. So a lot of them are making up their consumption with vegetables. I don't tell people, some people, I don't like greens, I don't like vegetables, they need more fruit. You know, you can, not that they're identical nutritionally, but if you're gonna compromise on one, try and make it up with the other category. So we'll talk about the, the recommendations here in a minute. I just want you to get a picture of uh, where we're at now. <coughs> Whole grain and sugar consumption. So <laughs> this is a very stunning slide, actually. What we see, this is where, um, this is where we're at. This is one of the graphs we're actually above. Uh, this is where this. What is this? This is okay. This is refined grains. So this this slide is interesting because it sort of I think it combines whole grains and refined grains. But anyway, these orange dots are the refined grain consumption. So that's all the white flour that we're seeing. So when I flip over a label or I'm looking at a product at the grocery store, I always look for the word whole. W H O L E. So if I pick something up and it says wheat flour, something like that, or or made from whole grains, you want to make sure the first ingredient is whole. A good example of that is shredded wheat, Cheerios, and oatmeal. And I'm not saying they're all equivalent, but what you'll notice when you pick them up, they all say whole. And then, of course, the sugar content is through the roof, right? <laughs> and, and, and ironically, these two things are often packaged together. When you pick up a food at the grocery store, say you pick up my favorite, okay, Oreos, You'll see refined flours, added oils, and the sugar all in the same package. And so when you change your diet, oftentimes when you make substitutions, it'll affect all three of them. Uh, protein foods, we're doing just fine with the protein foods. We're actually pretty on par. Uh, the dairy, we're, I guess they we're a little low in. Um, but, you know, in, in, the, in the five groups that we looked at today, their, their dairy consumption varies. So I'm not too concerned about that data. Um, although, you know, uh, drinking a quart, or I've seen, and I've talked with patients that have consumed, you know, four, five, six glasses of milk a day, right? So th there's a limit there. And they're not adding chocolate syrup to their milk either. Okay, so I'm not going to go over this slide in detail. You are, um, uh, it's, it's all right here. It'll say dietary guidelines for healthy Americans right at the bottom. That will bring you to a PDF that has these slides. So I'm not going to go over all the recommendations, but I want you to know that they're all here for you. So our vegetable intake, two and a half cups or cup equivalents a day, two cups of fruit, here we have six ounces of grains, some dairy, our protein foods, and our oils. So some of you might say, what, what's a cup, or what's a cup equivalent, or what's an ounce? That's where this slide on the left, that photo will tell you what constitutes an ounce. It's, it, you know, for grains, for example, half a cup of oatmeal or one slice of whole wheat bread would be considered an ounce equivalent. So this um, slide here on the left this photo will tell you how to interpret this slide on the right. And by the way, this presentation I'm filming, so I'll put two versions of this presentation up on my website, seantherd.com. If you go to um, Educate Yourself How-To Videos, I'll put the physical presentation as well as a PowerPoint presentation as well if you want to check out these slides later. And then, of course, represent Danny over here. Uh, 
physical activity guidelines. Remember, these folks, they're not going to the gym. The world's longest living people, they don't pump iron, they don't run marathons, and they don't join the gym. Instead, they live in environments that constantly nudge them into moving without thinking about it. And that's some of the best, because what we find is that you're better off moving a little bit every single day than trying to be what we call a weekend warrior where you just you work out on the weekend and you're sedentary it's best to keep that going throughout the week um and what we find across all age groups across all genders is we're simply not getting enough we need to be up here folks we need to be up here so there's a huge gap that has to be closed So what does that what does that look like? What are the current recommendations, right? And I know Dan, you can talk on this much better than I can. But 150 minutes of moderate aerobic activity weekly. This slide here constitutes aerobic activity. So gardening, dancing, brisk walking, housework, traditional hunting and gathering. <laughs> Let me grab my bow and arrow, I guess. Um, general building tasks. Okay. So a lot of what these centenarians are doing would all constitute this or um, or you can do 75 minutes of vigorous aerobic activity running fast cycling aerobics fast swimming so um, a lot of different choices here you can spread it out throughout the day some people say I don't have an hour to work out you can do three 20 minute sessions and then strength training this is one of the big reasons <coughs> about osteoporosis, right? A lot of times we're, we're scared to get osteoporosis. It's very common. It's not just the calcium consumption. It's not just the vitamin D from the sun. It's the weight-bearing exercises. So in the U.S., we have high rates of osteoporosis, yet we have some of the highest intakes of calcium per capita of anywhere in the world. I think we're number two. So why is it that a population that consumes so much calcium has such a high risk of osteoporosis? Well, yeah, because we're not telling that our body what to do with that calcium. Weight-bearing exercise. Yeah, so this constitutes, it says, do strength training exercises for all major muscle groups. Do at least a single set of each exercise heavy enough to tire your muscles after 15, 12 to 15 repetitions. So I'll let Danny field those questions, but those... <laughs> That's the current recommendations that I was able to find by the um, uh, Department of Human and Health Services. Okay, we are nearly done. We are nearly done. So let's recap. Physical activity is part of their lifestyle. They maintain a healthy weight or a healthy BMI throughout their adult life. They don't smoke or use tobacco products. I noticed a little bit when Costa Rica they were smoking, but for the most part, there's almost no, no typical use of, of smoking or tobacco products for these people. Meat, poultry, fish, and eggs are used as condiments and flavorings. Minimal added fat, sugar, refined grains, and processed foods. Now, if you're in Greece, they use more olive oil, Okay, but in other places they use less oils. And it's consumed at room temperature. They're not frying and, and high heat cooking with this oil. They eat the whole grains, the beans, which are high in fiber. It's a plant-centered diet that's using meat as an additive and a flavoring. And they have a variety of vegetables, a variety. So they say eat the rainbow. We're not talking about Skittles or Fruit Loops. It's <laughs> all, every, we're not, what they find? That's the interesting part about the wine. Why is this wine so valuable? Why is it so high in antioxidants? When your vegetables and your fruits take in sun during the summer, they create compounds that protect them against the sun, like natural sunscreen, if you will. When we eat those foods, our body doesn't just use that food for calories, for energy. It incorporates those colors, that protective compound. It incorporates that into our own body. So that's why all of these colors are important. When they look at disease risk and heart disease risk, there's a variety of different factors, right? But when you look at 
most of them are diet related. Not all of them, but most of them are. Okay, so real quick, two more minutes and then I'll be all done. So we're gonna talk about what we can do this holiday season and modify our meals a little bit so that we can resemble the diets that we've looked at today. So here we have our sweet potatoes with our marshmallows. Now I don't have, I don't, I don't particularly care for this. I didn't grow up eating the marshmallow dish, but um, you'll notice in Okinawa, and here are some other sweet potato dishes that we can make. If you combine them with corn, you combine them with beans. There's other ways you can eat it. The engine number two cookbook has a lasagna that has sweet potatoes in it. So there's other ways that we can cook our sweet potatoes. And here on the Blue Zone website, the recipe website is on here. It has a whole page just on squash recipes. So when you're getting ready for Thanksgiving or you're getting ready for Christmas, you can go on that website and check out how they recommend you prepare squash. So one of the recipes that we had back there today was the Walter salad. It is a salad. Mm -hmm. So that salad didn't have mayo in it. The recipe calls for Greek yogurt, which is higher in protein and lower in added fat. So uh, we're going from, I guess they call this ambrosia. I mean, it, it hardly resembles the, the fruits that are in it. <laughs> but but you'll notice here that we're light on the dressing. We've got some sour, we've got some walnuts in it, right? So that half a cup of mixed nuts per day. And we've got some fruits and other things in there. So this, you're, when you look at, at the diets of these people, you can identify the food on their plate. This is another often recommendation that we provide patients, okay? So instead of having vegetables with your pasta, you have pasta with your vegetables. So here we're going light on the sauce or they go with a pesto sauce or a red sauce. So moving away from the cream-based sauces, you ever go to olive oil? Olive oil. You ever go to Olive Garden? <laughs> the sauce is more calories than the pasta. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so here we're adding a ton of vegetables, highlighting the vegetables. Now at the bottom of this, I have my, my version of Alfredo sauce. It uses soaked cashews, some uh, garlic. You can put a dash of, of olive oil in there if you want, a little bit of plain almond milk, and it has some nutritional yeast in there. And I've actually prepared that and served that at Cardiac Rehab once. And it's actually pretty good. So I highly recommend you try, try out that recipe. <coughs> All right, so pork and beans, anybody? Beans and pork? <laughs> pork and beans? Okay, there's a lot wrong with that picture. One, what you'll notice with these populations, they're not consuming processed meats. Okay, bacon, sausage, hot dog, bologna. These things increase our risk for colon cancer. But beans are protective. So people say, well, what if I have beans with the pork? You know, it's, I don't have an answer for that one. Uh, but we're moving away. Here we have sort of a mix, okay? We have some beans, they have some onions, they have some corn. Heck, you could put some squash in there. And then uh, you can dress it in different ways, okay? I've used a little bit of like uh, vinegar and made like a three bean, like a cold three bean salad. Or um, I recently had tabbouleh which is a little bit different from this dish. But we're having beans, but not with the added brown sugar and the, the processed meat. It, like, which, which way are we going here, guys? <coughs> so what we notice here is that if you're gonna have vegetables, you're gonna have fruit, I want that dish to, to be centered around those foods. These diets in Greece and Italy, their diets are centered around <coughs> vegetables. And so when we have our, our delicious uh, free, uh, bean, or bean casserole here, it's got the French's onions, okay, which is, they're fried, and it has the Campbell's chicken, the soup, the mushroom soup. Do yourself a favor, next time you pick up the cream of mushroom soup, take a look at the sodium content on the bag, one. And two, 
look at the serving sizes. You'll notice in that little tiny can that you once thought was one serving is like two and a half, two and a half. Yeah, so you're looking at what, 800 milligrams times two and a half. So do yourself a favor. This one here is dressed with a little bit of like basil, basil pesto. I, you can do a variety of different dressings here, but here the vegetables are taking the center stage. And everybody's favorite, I don't know about you, but I grew up with this. Yeah. My favorite. You know where the, it comes out looking like the inside of the can? Yeah. And then you cut it right down the middle, you make a little sliver. Yeah. I used to hate this stuff growing up, right? But the nutrient value of these are very different, especially if you happen to get frozen cranberries and make it fresh yourself the antioxidant content will be vastly superior to that on the left. Mm. It won't look as cool. It, no, no. <laughs> but, but your arteries will thank you. Yes. So that's it. All right. I guess I'll take questions. Do you guys have any? In this book, they highlight someone who was living in Icaria and then they moved to the U.S. and they, they saw their health deteriorate, deteriorate, and they moved back. They started living that lifestyle, got a vineyard, they drank the wine, they ate the food, and they helped the group. And they had to climb the mountains to get anything. Yeah. I'm sort of surprised that with all those comparative things, they didn't show no tobacco at all, including the one in the U.S. Oh, oh yeah. No, Loma Linda, they're, very, they're the, the strictest in terms of... The, the caffeine, the alcohol, and the cigarette consumption. Uh, what is the effect of tobacco and heart disease? That's a great question. So, in your arteries, you have something called the endothelial lining. It's the inside lining of your arteries. And what happens when we smoke, when we breathe in secondhand smoke, when I'm riding my bicycle and the big truck drives by, okay, when we get exposed to different toxins in our food, pesticides, those actually start to damage that endothelial lining. Kind of like you get a little nick in your skin. And so what happens in the process of repairing that, your body uses cholesterol to form a scab, and when that scab builds up over time, you get that plaque deposition, that atherosclerosis that you're referring to. It damages the lining of the artery. How well does it reverse when you quit smoking? <laughs> well, it's not just the smoking, right? So you can stop doing the bad stuff. You also have to start doing the good stuff, too, because your body needs the good stuff to do the repair. So it's a combination of both. It's highly individual, um, and I I don't have any data on that. There is data for how your lung tissue repairs after a stop quitting smoking. I don't know too much about that damage of any real lining. Good question. Do you ever go into the schools? I have, yeah. I've been at South Eugene High. I did um, two different high schools in um, in Northern California. I also did an elementary school in uh, LA where I actually got a grant and built a vegetable garden and taught the kids about how to grow vegetables and they're eating it. So I have gone into the school, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a great question. What we find is that when you compare the nutrient value to dried beans over canned beans, you actually find that they're very similar. The only difference would be the salt content. So I make sure that I get the no salt added. You'll say no salt added right on the front, but of course you never want to trust anything on the front of the label. So I always flip it around and I just make sure that you know it'll be 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, 30 milligrams, very low. You can rinse it at home if you want. Or uh, if you have a pressure cooker, you can make the beans from scratch. Just the baked beans, they got the added brown sugar. And if you're gonna make baked beans, 
get the beans and add the sugar yourself rather than someone else add it. This is about you being in control of your food. So if you're gonna add salt, sugar, fat, oil, I want you to do it at home. I don't want someone else to do it. What about the sun belt? These all seem to be similar latitudes. Yeah, that's a, there's nothing north that's or far south. Yeah, no, that's it definitely the high exposure to the sun, the vitamin D, yeah. Um, I don't know, I mean, it, it does allow them a lifestyle where they can be outside, but that's not to say that the weather is always nice enough to be outside, because in Okinawa, they do get a lot of tropical storms, and in um, they noticed in Greece, it can get pretty cold, especially the higher elevation, so that's also important. The higher the elevation, the colder and the stormier it's gonna get. But that, yeah, it is an interesting, uh, an interesting point. When you're out of surgery, they say um, increase your protein, and I assumed it meant increase meat-based protein. So, what would be your take on that? Yeah. So certainly, there's a healing process that has to happen after surgery, right? Especially open heart surgery, you're gonna have a deep wound there that needs to heal, and so. If you're eating adequate calories from whole food sources, not the processed stuff that we looked at in the center, whole food sources, it's nearly impossible to become protein deficient. Now, if you want to have an extra snack or an extra serving of beans or peanut butter or something like that, or even a slice of whole grain bread, like Dave's Killer Bread, will have four to five grams of protein in it. So what we find is that, um, actually, that vegetarians, such as the Loma Linda population, consume more protein per capita than the average American consuming meat. And we do know that protein from plant sources rather than animal sources is less inflammatory and it's easier on the kidneys to digest. Now, did you have a question, Megan? Yes, um, what is the nutritional difference between black beans and like pinto beans or some of the more common beans? Okay, yeah, so the question is what, what bean is the best? And if you go to um, nutritionfacts.org, which is a recommended resource, that you type in beans at the search box in the top, it'll actually, they, they, they pick them head to head. Uh, I think they said kidney beans, but all things considered, um, green beans not having the same benefit that we see with our, our dried beans, for the most part, most of the beans are pretty similar, but I think red beans won out on that one. Any other questions? Nope. Everyone's ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just want to thank you all for your attendance. It's great. You know, we couldn't do this without you. So. <laughs>